I kind of base a lot of my decisions on like, what's the hypothesis? What's, what do we want to test? And then taking those results to kind of determine what we do next. And yeah, it's been a really successful method, especially in marketing, because there's always that gut feeling you, to, that you need to create good art. And I think you need that in marketing, but then you do need the data side of things as well. So I really like analogy. Thing. Wouldn't it be amazing if you could always have the very best creative, the most amazing creative, the perfect creative for each ad campaign? Welcome to Mobile Heroes Uncensored. My name is John Gutsier. Today, of course, as usual, Peggy is our co-host. And you know what? She's a trooper today because she's super under the weather, was just at a conference and is now kind of uh, dragging around, but still <laughs> doing the work. So welcome, Peggy. Thank you for being here today. Of course, we're chatting about creative, the art, the science, the dream, and the very best way to find and improve the ad units that work best. Peggy, who's our guest? Well, John, I have to start out, you know me, no matter what, the pun patrol will come for me. Oh, no. I just Save have, us. I, the, show must, <laughs> the show must literally go on. So here I am. And I also couldn't miss our guest because... So Siri was just trying to save me, by the way. I said the word save. Us. <laughs> Siri was like, here's some information about save. <laughs> no, Sorry, go ahead, Peggy. <laughs> there's no way to escape it, John. No way to escape it. But seriously, I did want to make the show because I connected with Philippa Leiburn, our guest, and she is... You talk about art and science, she combines them. She's the user acquisition manager at Trail Mix. That's the game studio that, like the name of the snack, right, the raisins and the nuts, it makes games snackable, nourishing, John. Wow. There you go. And she's on a mission to make Love and Pies the biggest casual game ever, which is anything but an uphill battle since the company also just got $60 million cash investment from Supercell earlier this year. They're on a run. Now, Philip has started. Like Supercell her knows what they're doing too, a little bit in the games industry. So that might be a pretty smart investment. Yeah, yeah. I was thinking about that. And uh, Philippa started her career in ad ops, building campaigns across different publishers. Then she took a position at King, spurred on by her love of Candy Crush, so a personal love and passion. She got her working in casual before moving to Trail Mix. And dating back to her days at a startup, she's also a little scrappy and has stayed that way. You know, she has a hands-on approach. She enjoyed wow. working in an environment where no two days look the same. That's what it says on her LinkedIn profile. And I think she's in the right place because our show is anything but dull. <laughs> Welcome, Philippa. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Welcome. Super pumped to have you. I mean, that's quite the intro. That's awesome. And $60 million from Supercell. I said it already, but... Wow, uh, you know, Supercell knows what it takes to make it in, in the games industry, right? So that's pretty impressive. I had to start off with this question here because I noticed that your your major game, Love and Pies Merge Game, is the title. Like literally, Love and Pies Merge Game is the title on the App Store. And I think it's Love and Pies Merge on Android, on Google Play. I found it super interesting that you put the kind of game in the name of the game. And that says to me, there's something going on in the ecosystem, perhaps, that people are looking for merge games, that they want merge games. Tell me the story behind that. Well, I think there was a lot of testing, and this was probably predating me, <laughs> um, my, me joining the company. But yeah, I think it's exactly what it says on the Tim, right? Like, our game is very much focused on love and very much focused around food. The protagonist goes back to her mom's cafe to run that and meets potential love interest who is a chef wow. so yeah spies movie. <laughs> here we come <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly we didn't include merge in the name of the title which again was interesting but very important for aso which is why you see it on the app source got it think. got it okay cool that answers the question peggy well let's get back to you philippa you're a mobile hero it's one of the reasons you're here but you're also a performance marketer with a degree in psychology. Love this connection, right? You combine art and science. Where does the passion come from? It's a relatively cheesy answer, but I have enjoyed psychology all along for my whole life. 
I think I'm just a, quite a people focused person. Like I love socializing. I love learning about people. I've, I've always been very interested in how people's minds work. So it was very easy for me to pick psychology at A level and then loved it and as a degree. But I guess that was my main introduction to science. I, I wasn't really doing science based things before that. And I didn't really think I, I liked science that much. And then kind of the blend of art and science. Well, I think it was first my older brother who made me think about marketing like a science. So he also worked in marketing. He worked in programmatic. And I remember I was going for an interview and he was trying to explain like what programmatic was. And I was getting so confused. And he was like, just think about testing. Think about it like a science experiment. And it really, really stuck with me. And now... Yeah, I kind of base a lot of my decisions on like, what's the hypothesis? What's, what do we want to test? And then taking those results to kind of determine what we do next. And yeah, it's been a really successful method, especially in marketing, because there's always that gut feeling you, to, that you need to create good art. And I think you need that in marketing, but then you do need the data side of things as well. So I really like analogy. I'm fascinated by the background in psychology. You're not the only mobile hero that we've talked to that has a background in psychology. We had one, I think it was just like six or eight episodes ago, Peggy. Mm -hmm. The name is 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 escaping me right now. But we also chatted, it's got to be a couple of years now, uh, with Rory Sutherland. Yeah. Uh, Ogilvy. And he has a background in social sciences as well. And talk a little bit, Philip, about how your psychology background impacts the choices you make in creative, in language, in marketing focus and direction? Yeah, the text part is quite interesting. So I do a lot of work on Google UAC and on, well, Google Ads and on TikTok. And those are two channels where you can write caption for your ads. And we don't necessarily have a copywriter and I don't think we have one where we work before. So I was like, great, this is my chance to like test so many different messages. And I kind of uh, look back at some of the stuff I learned in psychology. So like social psychology kind of says, if your friends are playing a game, you might be more likely to play. It. So I basically went through like loads of biases and preferences people have and then tested them on my ads. So like one was the social thing. All my friends downloaded this game and I can't stop playing. And yeah, just A-B tested them against each other. And I literally love doing that. At the moment, the one that's working well is reverse psychology, which is like, uh, you should try this game. But hey, what do I know? Like, that's <laughs> fun. And it's really funny because sometimes people, I, I also like looking through the comments and people are like, has the like person running this ad broken the fourth wall? Like they know we're watching kind of thing. Uh, uh, so, uh, I'm really uh, entertained by that. <laughs> That's pretty sophisticated. It's funny because when I see an ad like that, maybe I'm just contrarian or just a jerk. I don't know, Peggy, you can tell me, but <laughs> don't tell me. <laughs> but if I see an ad like all my friends are playing this, I'm more likely to not play it. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's there like, sort of a reverse psychology. No <laughs> one's playing this game, so you should. Maybe that would work. <laughs> Maybe you just want to be a trailblazer. The first Thank one you. to be. Yeah. I need some fix, I guess. You need psychology <laughs> coming through again. She's got you nailed, John. <laughs> yeah. I love it also. You know, I'm a great fan of The Nudge, and I see that being so relevant right now. It's just like that book, take it down, take a look at it. We're back there. The power of The Nudge. You also believe in the power of personalization. When you're choosing a winning creative, that it is more aligned with the user than you know, the generic creatives. What's, what's the way you approach this? What's the best practice you can share when it comes to personalizing ad creatives? Yeah, something I found really interesting that happened at King was with retargeting campaigns. So obviously with retargeting, you have quite a lot more data than just UA campaigns because they're your users. You have first party data that you might have collected. So we knew things like what level they lapsed on or did they in-game currency or had they run out, what made them lapse. And then the team there used that in their ads. So it was kind of like, oh, you've reached, you have no lives left. Here's a gift, some free lives or something like that. 
So that's really interesting way to use personalization and definitely saw some good results there. But more broadly with personalization, I think you should be personalizing the context of your ads. Where might the person be seeing this? On what channel, in what format? So yeah, like working on YouTube specific creatives. So it should be landscape. It should be more narrative rather than having just gameplay compared to some of our other ads. And that's something I worked on as well. Taking it away from gameplay and having more narrative stuff at the beginning. King, which we weren't doing that much at the time. So that was really exciting and, and worked quite well as well. Philippa, I want to ask you a question about creative because we recently just had a guest and I think he was saying, you know, stay away from quirky creative, stay away from, you know, th- like I, if I was running UA for a game, I'd be tempted to throw a few dollars, something like uh, just a big banner that says, insert stupid ass game ad here. And just see what people would click on it, right? <laughs> see what would happen. Yeah. But the we person we were chatting with uh, was saying, "Yeah, I don't, I don't." What, what's your take? Do you do some stuff that's just crazy off the wall and see what sticks, or do you kind of have a plan and a strategy and stick with it? So we do do some crazy things, definitely. Because as a team, like at Felmic, everyone, re- I mean. This should be for all companies, but here everyone is so passionate about the game and everyone is also quite interested and we share a lot about uh, what all disciplines are doing. So we'll show the whole team some of our ads and we'll, everyone can see our results. And so people naturally have an opinion. And this is where some crazy ideas do come from because people know so much about the game that potentially we don't know if they're the narrative writers the game designers. So more recently, um, I don't know if you've played Love and Pies, but the yeah. board is um, the board gets full and the storage is a fridge. But we have like food items on our board. We have animals on our board, and we joked internally like, "Oh, you put your cat in the fridge, like the storage." And then, but obviously, like, yeah, we didn't really think about the fact that like that doesn't make any sense. So we <laughs> actually made like riffed on that idea and have made like a few ads on this now um that what that we push live we had no idea if they were necessarily a good idea or or a strong idea but it's interesting for our team and it's, it's just fun to do a few things where it's like who knows what's going to happen but it's definitely a, a fun concept <laughs> and if you if your whole team can see the results then you might see oh wow we struck gold on something that was seemingly crazy exactly so yeah it's really exciting having fun that cool yeah i did read about that i remember that it was uh, n- a number of articles saying a cat in the fridge is that like hamster in the <laughs> microwave but won't go there won't go there um <laughs> when you did have creativity to pick some pretty cool ads you also use it to develop your own metrics and you really blew me away philippa because you are thinking about well there isn't a metric to measure this so i'll make it up and that's exactly what you did. You have something called hook rate, you know, and that is very cool. What does it actually measure and what has it helped you do as a marketer? Yeah, that's a good question. So hook rate is more about uh, engagement with your ad. So it helps us basically understand the opening of, of our video and the strength of that. So, you know, everyone's really interested in the first three seconds of the video or like what stops you scrolling past. And and that metric is basically to to tell you, to help you compare between ads, how good your, that hook is. And I guess, yeah, we, we, there wasn't a metric for it, but also with our creative testing, you know, it's quite binary. You get a winner and you get a loser. And we were in an annoying position where we couldn't beat our control video. Like our winner was on <laughs> and which is actually a good thing because it means it was an amazing video, but you don't want to be stuck there for too long. And there came a stage where we just were like, okay, this is lost. This is lost. And we weren't really gaining anything from, from that. Like what were we learning? And so it felt like there was more to dig into. Maybe why are we losing? Um, and yeah, so it was kind of born out of that as well. If if CPI tells you how many installs you're getting and what, what price you're getting for, 
how can we really understand why something's winning or losing? And I think engagement metrics tell you a bit more about rather than just the, just the other metrics that we usually rely on. I love it. I love it. It's super interesting because as we lose some of the metrics that we've always depended upon with granular device level data, mm. uh, privacy sandbox, ETT, all that stuff, right? Then you've got to look at other metrics as well and having a sense of, hey, people watched the first three seconds and then continued or they just flipped. That's yes. really, really important. You've got to use the metrics you can get, right? As many, and then you've got to decide which ones you wait and all that stuff. Question, is there one thing that you often see or a key characteristic that distinguishes a winning ad from a losing ad? Is there something that you notice? It is a really good question. I don't have a add this in and it will win. Although I, I would say yeah. like, <laughs> and everybody would have it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. exactly. But I do think there's something in like the build of anticipation in an ad. So what I mean by that is like an ad. Okay. There's loads of ads that start in a certain way and you're like, mm, okay, this is going to happen. And you can almost predict what's going to happen. And then suddenly something really weird out of the blue happens. Like that almost interrupts the narrative, but then it goes back to what you expected to happen. And I think a lot of things follow that. Like, for example, you know, when you see ads where you can pick three choices, that became a massive trend in the industry. And it's like, oh, help this person do it. And then one choice is really obvious. Like a spanner would help you fix a washing machine. One choice is like a nail will help you fix a washing machine. And the other choice is like a ham. Yeah, like a chicken. And you're like, oh, they're not going to pick chicken. And lo and behold, the ad chooses a chicken. It's like that build up or that kind of storytelling where it's like, I know what's going to happen. This is so obvious. This storyline is building, it's building, blah, 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 blah. Bang. The unexpected thing happens. But then the conclusion is basically what you expected anyway. Help me fix this situation. Of course. And like. Rise. Nice. Yeah, I think, I think that's the key the key it's like people have to understand the narration enough but not so much that they're bored by the outcome that's a really interesting point you just made because you can't be so far out of the box that there's zero comprehension of what is happening here it's in a different universe a different dimension but it can't be so in the box that it's like i've seen it before done for not paying any attention exactly. you know, it's literally one percent of my attention until i can flip to the next thing or something like that right that's an interesting balance yeah and you don't want your wild thing to just yeah exactly be so wild that people are like, are like oh you just put that in there for to be the attention grabber it still yeah. needs that strong that's what i mean by build up it still needs the story art to make sense thinking cool. about wild creatives and it just stays with me because i would have been the person who said okay let's take that out that's not going anywhere and i'm talking about the creative like the qr code that took the super bowl by storm yeah it's just yeah. A, a pong thing going on yet it was hugely successful. i love that you loved it john i love that that's awesome it's crazy it's stupid it's simple it's that genius. Is super stupid <laughs> yes but it's stupid enough to be genius that the, the cross that those emerges worlds collided <laughs> there you go that's what happened i was going to ask you though you know other than the cat in the fridge the wildest creative that you saw just drive insanely positive results for your game maybe i'm biased or and or hurt by the fact that this creative couldn't be beaten <laughs> but i'm going to talk about the one that we couldn't beat so to me it was quite surprising that it won it didn't have any gameplay and it is essentially a fail video really when I think about it so it does maybe make sense but basically the gist of it is the main character in our game asks the chef who's the other main character in the game to make her a cake he adds in the ingredients you see him adding them into the pot accidentally he adds in broccoli and <laughs> to a chocolate cake which ah. <laughs> then this all mixes up and lo and behold, he makes the broccoli cake and they're really sad. And that is the entire ad. No gameplay, okay. no, nothing 
that special and it's unbeatable. And I, that really blew my mind. Like, I don't funny. understand. <laughs> you are a code. I'm sorry. I'm just <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 Exactly. I think you are good before the broccoli cake. That's yeah, that. <laughs> definitely. <laughs> we, we've done a few follow-up things like, is, is this the magic of broccoli cake? Like, is, is it broccoli? <laughs> But it's it's not broccoli. It's not broccoli. We we don't know what it we is. We don't know. <laughs> Plan for a partnership well. with Bird's Eye, Philip. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about A/B testing a little bit. I mean, on its on a surface level, super interesting. Mm. Which one wins, right? But when you have a super successful ad that's working well, you know you need to move on to something. You know you're going to get creative fatigue. You know you're going to re reach diminishing returns. All that stuff. And yet you're, you're reading with it right now, right? So how do you do creative testing? What, what do you do? 10% of your impressions, 5%, 1%, whatever. How do you identify winners and how much effort do you put into which will be the next main ad units versus this one is killing it for us right now. You know, keep it going. So we, I mean, actually, I'm a big believer in keeping things going for as long as you possibly can. Like, I know we had Valentine's ad groups or Valentine's Creative Live. Maybe we still have a few live now. And that was all just go. So if it's working, it's working. Like, there is nothing wrong with keep it live. But I do think more recently, um, our team has been a lot more focused on iteration. And in a way, it's kind of born out of the hook rate thing in that you can, it's much easier to identify first three seconds are good is it this part's that good where are people dropping off and then come up with new ideas and also it's really interesting to know this was a really strong opening but maybe the rest of the narrative isn't keep this opening and use a and then do a different concept with it. so kind of lends itself to iterations quite a lot so now there's a focus on like okay we have a winner or we have a, a loser how are we going to use the elements that work well and maybe the next video or iterate that concept, which is really exciting. I like your point about continuing and even using Valentine's months half a year afterwards. Uh, maybe that's a strategy. I don't know. I keep getting in-app ads in the game that I'm currently playing most that are Halloween ads, Halloween specials. And I'm mm -hmm. like, oh, these guys are idiots. They're running you know, campaigns that are months old. And maybe that's the secret sauce that people are like, oh. <laughs> Attention, attention grabbing or something like that it's like a, a mistake oh they kept that promotion running must be really good maybe i can get in on i don't know but maybe, maybe. we well, got your attention john so it's working see <laughs> also got my ire <laughs> <laughs> don't want that so philip you call yourself a people person that's really important because whether creative wins or loses it's a team effort and you have to deliver that feedback in a way that's constructive not destructive. How do you do that and avoid that blame game of like, your creative sucks and now we have all these problems. No, it's got to be, it has to be constructive and it has to be a learning experience. How do you handle that? Also a good question. I think... They're only good questions, Philip. <laughs> <laughs> You're here on our show. <laughs> <laughs> Identify the bad ones for us, will you? That was a bad question. <laughs> 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 I think, again, it, it kind of goes back to trial mixes culture to an extent in that, like I said before, everyone sees our creative. Like we have a dedicated uh, show and tell meeting once a week where everyone gets to show stuff they're doing in their own teams or stuff they've worked on. Sometimes we put creatives in that. Everyone can react. It's actually really useful sometimes, like exactly what I'm saying about narrative, where we come up with the brief. So we're like, this is genius. And then the feedback is like, I actually have no idea what that ad was trying to be. And you're like, oh, okay, we maybe we went a bit too <laughs> Ahead of uh, our time. Ahead of our time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, we do have a, a, a big feedback culture, but also born out of the hook rate, born out of wanting to beat this creative slump we were in. We... Well, we now have a meeting called the Creative Retro as well. And in that we do, so we look through creative results. So again, it's transparent. Everyone can see them. And we also go through hook rates, watch times, 
called pesto ads, lots of different things inside of that. And I think like by the, the meeting's really fun. It's more of a discussion than this didn't win. So like everything is discussed, everything, but through a, through a lens of what parts do we want to take that are good? And so I hopefully that leaves people feeling like, all right, like there's so many good parts of my ad. Maybe it didn't win, but maybe we're going to recycle it. And we really end those meetings with like pages of ideas. And by the end of it, people are like, just feel really good because we've had a massive brainstorm. It feels really creative. So yeah, it becomes like, yeah, maybe it was negative, but the feedback itself and how we build on it should, well, does feel really positive. So that's quite nice. Okay. I kind of get the sense, Peggy, that uh, it would be fun working with Philippa. Sounds like <laughs> yeah, it'd be I an interesting to have me on. I, I can't, I can imagine that. So Philippa, we are all out of good questions. We only have bad ones left. Uh, so I'm going to add one for you. What is your least censored opinion about mobile marketing? I think that when we are replaced, which I think is going to happen by robot and like automation takes over our jobs, I am, I'm for this. I am in the camp of this should happen sooner rather than later because I think it's going to lead to a different marketing world where it Less time will be spent on creating campaigns and has space for human error. And more time will be spent on things like, how do we feed the algorithm? Like, what data can we use to help this machine do this automatic response that it needs to do? And I think that's going to be a really cool and interesting time of marketing. Like, maybe we'll be, like, able to deep dive into our users and see this is the path to purchase. and feed that information to the algorithm or this robot that now helps us and it will make much more decisions than we potentially could because we are, I mean, we can't be as good as, as computers at finding the right people, but we can be good at coming up with ideas that, that help. And I think that'd be really cool. So I'm, uh, roll on, roll on robot. I'm there for it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. That's it. That's an interesting one. Very, very cool. You know what? I mean, we'll have the robots creating the marketing campaigns. We'll have the robots playing the games. Why do we need people at all? You know, system. <laughs> we'll be part of the battery to get the system going. Uh, and I guess we'll end here. Your top three tips for mobile marketers heading into 2023. I can't not say to focus on creatives. <laughs> so... <laughs> I'm going to say definitely build dashboards that everyone can see that like your creative team should know your creative test results and should know what's working in BAU as well. They should know everything that your, you as a UA manager knows and the disconnect can potentially harm. So make sure everyone's in the loop. Another tip, maybe about automation only because it's top of mind and we're working on stuff yes, today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, we, we've recently looked at actually in creatives as well, automating creative uploads and things that just take time that's definitely unnecessary. And it's been really amazing and changed a lot. I think yeah, it's only a matter of time until we have like a stable diffusion or dolly or mid journey or something like that for ad creatives. Feeding your ads, there you go. Um, you know, we're seeing all these pictures on social and people have fed their picture, their yeah. Uh, into into the AI machine lens up, right? And Lensa is just killing it at the moment, right? And mm -hmm. they get all these things. You're going to do that with your ad creative. Uh, it's an interesting world. Well, it was great having you. I thought it was inspiring, you know, co-creation with AI. So it's like a good thing. It's going to take the dredge work out of it. Democratize the data and some great tips for AV testing creatives and picking that winner that will also get John's attention. So thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so Thanks much. So it's much. been really fun. <laughs> Uh, it was a lot of fun. And thank you to all the listeners. We really do appreciate you. Hope you're enjoying it. Let us know on social if you are. And let us know if you want to come and we'll have you on the show. If you're a mobile hero or you know of someone who is, then fill out the interest form over at shorturl.at forward slash JKSKT. Also, Liftoff has a Slack for mobile heroes and people in the mobile ecosystem. 
There's a link on the screen. And if you're listening to the podcast, it's at info.liftoff.io slash slack dash sign up. It's pretty cool. There's smart people there. And you know what? They probably need you too. And you have probably been completely blown away by all the insights on this show. And you want your transcript. And you can have it because the transcripts are over at Liftoff's website. Go to liftoff.io, click on Heroes, and then click on Podcast. I actually personally love transcripts because I read way faster than people talk. So that's a great way to get the insights really, really quickly. Until next time, this is John Kutz here. Thank you so much for joining. And this is Peggy Ann Saltz signing off for Mobile Heroes Uncensored. <laughs>